Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Um, a few announcements. Uh, first of all, this Wednesday we will have our small group dinner finishing up the fall study. So if you are able to attend, join us at 6.30 p.m. PM at Supermax. Spouses are welcome. Uh, please let me know if you're planning to come. Um, we want to thank everyone who helped last week with setup and serving, cleanup, who brought dishes. Um, it was a wonderful time to have our annual Thanksgiving feast. It went very smoothly. Thank you all for your, for your help. Um, Pastor Jim, would you like to make an announcement about Jog? Well, if you look in your bulletin there, um, we're really excited about our next Jog speaker. Um, I heard he's just a great communicator, and uh, I hope you guys can come. This last, uh, last jog meeting, we, we were totally packed out, and uh, so we just have to just keep planning for more and more food, but we had four pieces of lasagna left over last time. That was it, but it was just a, just a great time, but I really hope you guys can come. It's a wonderful time of fellowship and being with uh, God's people, so again, uh, bring a friend, and remember, first-timers are free. And some of you may have heard, but if you want to sing with the choir, join us right over here at 10 a.m. next Sunday. Um, we're going to have another rehearsal. And if you don't want to join the choir, hide. <laughs> um, we wish a very happy birthday this week to Bob States. And then um, a couple of people to keep in prayer. We, our deepest condolences go to Ray Craig. Um, his father passed this week. And um, we also keep Carol Peterson in prayer, who lost her brother recently. Let us open worship with a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful fall morning to gather and to turn our hearts and our minds towards you. As we sit and focus our attention on you, our, our hearts and minds also go out to all those in the world who are in need of your hope, your comfort, your healing, your guidance, your wisdom. Lord, we think of those in our congregation who are grieving. We pray for Ray and his family. We pray for Carol Peterson and, and her family. And Lord, we, we lift all the silent prayers in this room before you as well. God, as we um, come out of Thanksgiving week, we also we think of the many blessings that you have given to each one of us. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of love and the beauty of creation. We thank you for the beauty of living our lives in relationship with you, Lord. And God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would move and tend and work through this time of worship. We pray that you would speak through the worship music, through the scripture, and through the message we hear this morning and through our conversations and our time with one another. Lord, may our faith be enriched and built up as we spend this time praising you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand and to join together in our first worship song, Ancient of Days.
You may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Genesis 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. And then continuing on to verses 14 through 18. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And then our next scripture reading is from Psalm 8, verses 1 through 5. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. And then our final scripture reading is from Matthew 5, verses 43 through 45. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. May God grant us wisdom in our hearing of these readings. Thank you so much, Tyler. That's a wonderful song. Uh, the children are dismissed to go to Sunday school, and uh, I wanted to say it was wonderful last Sunday to have uh, so many guests here with us, and then also, uh, did you guys get enough food to eat last week? <laughs> we were at five different gatherings, so I'm going to have to go on a diet, I think. But uh, we had a wonderful time with the preschool kids last uh, Wednesday, and, and they made these little 
uh, placemats, and they wrote the things they were thankful for. And I was thinking how good it is at a young age to really learn what it is to have an attitude of gratitude. Today I want to talk to you about common grace and what a gift it is that God has given us with his creation. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we are just so thankful that you have created us and you have created the world and that you are allow us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I pray as we look at your scriptures this day that we'll have more appreciation of what you have done and just your ability to create the vastness of this universe. Thank you for your love, and thank you, Lord, for being here as our unseen guest this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. My brother Steve uh, shared the following story with me, and I want to pass it on to you. He wrote, a, a number of years ago, I led a group of teenagers on a backpacking trip to Tuolumne um, Meadows in Yosemite Park. Just before the sun began to set, on our first night, we all took a walk in the meadow. It was a gorgeous night, cool, crisp, clear air. Silence could uh, hear the wind and the tall pines, the Tuolumne uh, Falls were, uh, were falling over some rocks. Other than that, there was silence. We sat down on a bridge and didn't realize it, but we just sat down to watch one of the most incredible shows, uh, just like a big performance that I've ever seen in my life. Now, kind of picture in your minds the eye what it was like for my brother Steve and these young people in Yosemite, and I'm sure all of us had, had experiences like this. But he said, the, the sun began to set, and as it did, the sky began to change colors. God, the artist, began to splash colors on his canvas, orange, pink, violet, deep purple, red, magenta. And as the colors in the sky began, this continual unfolding, the granite domes that encircled the valley they too began to reflect the colors of the sky. We felt as though we were just swimming in this sea of color, immersed, enveloped, enveloped by the creation. And then, as though that was not enough, just as the color show ended, as the last traces of the orange and reds began to dissipate, and the deep, dark violets and purples were giving way to the black of night, as the stars began to appear in the sky, a bright light began to shine from behind one of the granite domes. And up from behind that dome came a full moon, bright, clear, and it too lit up the whole valley. It was amazing. I was thinking, what a gift that is. Have you ever had a moment like that? When you are just overwhelmed with the beauty of God's reflect of his creation reflected in in what he's created I don't know how many of you have ever seen the northern lights but that too is an amazing sight and it just you just realize wow we're so small in this universe compared to what God has made and and what a gift it was one of those moments in life that we have like that we're very much aware that we've been given a gift in the truest sense. In a sense that you did absolutely nothing to deserve it. You did nothing to earn it. You didn't even think of it or scheme to get it. These type of experiences are just a pure gift. And I was thinking that, that this description about grace resonates with us. As we go, as we think about grace today, we, we'll learn that it's like a, a diamond it's multifaceted. The more you rotate it, it catches lights in a different way. And this morning story of, hiking, of a hiking trip is a wonderful picture of grace, a beautiful sunset and moonrise given to a group of people absolutely free. It's as though God said, hey, enjoy this for a while. No charge. Isn't that great? I remember talking to one of my neighbors up in Montana. He said, you know, Jim, he said, like, every day there's a different sunset. It's like God's 
painting a picture for us to enjoy, and everyone's different. You see, God is undes grace is undeserved and unearned. Like the performance in Yosemite that night, it is an element of surprise of the unexpected. What's even more surprising about grace is that it's not even asked for. I want to share with you something about grace written by Frederick Buechner. If any of you ever get a chance to read a book by Frederick Buechner, do it, because it'll, it'll really um, change your thinking about God's grace. He says, grace is something you can never get but only be given. There's no way to earn it or deserve it or bring it about any more than you can deserve the, you deserve the taste of raspberries and cream or earn good looks or bring about your own birth. A good sleep is grace, and so are good dreams. Most tears are grace. The smell of rain is grace. Somebody loving you is grace. Loving somebody is grace. When we were in seminary, we studied a guy named, uh, a theologian named Benjamin Warfield, and he wrote, grace is the unmerited favor of God toward the undeserved. Undeserved favor, unmerited love. You know what? You and I are recipients of grace. God pours out his blessing, his goodness, his grace on all people. When we take a walk on the beach, like these beautiful days we've had lately, have, have any of you gone on any hikes lately? It's beautiful, you know, the, it's been so clear and beautiful around here, and just to, to, to walk around, it's, we experience God's grace. And some of you like to go to the ocean and, and sing those dolphins jumping, it, playing in the surf, that's grace as well. Catching a wave and just feeling that around you is a moment of grace. Sitting down with a friend for a cup of coffee or chai tea or whatever and having a meaningful conversation. Feeling love and understood, that's grace. Holding a sleeping child in your arms and falling asleep together, that's grace. So many of life's greatest pleasures, the things that really seem to make life meaningful and worthwhile, these are moments of grace. They're gifts which we don't earn or deserve. They just happen to come our way. In seminary, we learned uh, from theologians that they coined a, a term for this kind of grace. The grace given to all people. Do you know what they call it? It's called common grace. Will you repeat that with me? Common grace. Common grace. Common grace, that makes sense, doesn't it? You see, common grace is for everybody. In other words, God loves all people, regardless of their behavior or actions. God loves all people. His love is unconditional. God is indiscriminate in his love. His love, his grace is common to all. Good people and evil people both enjoy the gift of life. Both enjoy the beauty of creation. Both are recipients of God's common grace. But as Christians, we experience his grace even further. Because of what Christ did for us on the cross, we experience his special grace, his saving grace. That's where we experience forgiveness and newness of life, of a transformed life. Wasn't that beautiful last Sunday when we heard people share what they were thankful for? Their gratitude to God? I was thinking about when Jen shared and how she had been, you know, a drug pusher and how she had ended up in jail and how she almost died. You know, she got, she got shot twice. And I remember when she used to walk here from the Heritage House North with her child and how she was far from God. It was eight years ago. She gave her life to Christ. There's been tremendous transformation. She got her, her son back. And now she's working on a doctorate degree at UCI in criminology. Folks, that's grace. Isn't that amazing? And we heard different people share how, you know, people have gone through difficult times losing loved ones. And yet in the middle of all that, you experience God's grace and help and a sense of belonging here to our church family. And I thought, wow, that's grace. 
We can't change our human heart. Only God can do that. And as Christians, we experience God's saving grace. And that's different than common grace. Nowhere is common grace more clearly seen than in creation. If it were not for God's creating common grace, none of us would be sitting here this morning. Were it not for God's common grace, there wouldn't be a world at all. The world, the universe, all there is, it is only here for one reason, because of God's grace. Our text today out of Genesis 1 tells us that God uh, started all of creation, and it's because of his grace. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God uh, swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. Then there was light. Why, you may be asking yourself, is it grace? Well, I'll tell you why. It's grace because God created it. He created this world, the galaxies, the solar system, the black holes, the countless stars. He created all this out of nothing. He simply spoke it into existence. You know, when we used to go up to Cedar Lake camp, sometimes we'd take a star walk, and we'd just look at the stars, and Pat Doyle would often talk about the different uh, constellations and how we're looking back billions of years. We're looking back at stars that are burned out, and it's just incredible. Um, Jim's put together, a, he's going to show us a, a slideshow, and uh, we got it on a YouTube. It's called Mind Bl God's Creation. It's about God's creation. It's, it's called mind-blowing, earth compared to the rest of the universe. So I want you to just, just enjoy the next couple minutes as we show you uh, this video.
Isn't that mind-boggling? I mean, to think about that, how, how do we even wrap our minds around that? One guy described them um, just like, like eternity. He was saying it's like if you could picture the sun like a big stainless steel ball and you had a snail going around that stainless steel ball and the time it would take the snail to wear the stainless steel ball out is a second in eternity. I mean, there's some of these things, it's like, they're just mind-boggling. <clears throat> See, God created all these things, and it's just incredible. One theologian put it this way. He says, to say that God is a creator, it's to say that the free, transcendent God is generous and welcoming. God was in no way compelled to create the world. It's an act of free grace. Creation is a gift, a benefit. When we confess God as creator, we are saying something about the character of God. You see, for grace to be grace, it must be free. And God created everything, including you and me, out of, out of love. Our very existence is a result of God's grace. Have you ever considered this idea before? How did you get here? How much did you really have to do with your own birth? You and me being here is a gift of pure grace. I mean, you think of the, the millions and millions of sperm that had to unite with one ovum and just for us to be born. And then you, you think you had to have parents and grandparents, great-grandparents. It goes back generations. Us being here is grace. You know, I became very much aware of God's creation when I watched our first child, Jonathan, come into the world. For those of you who have ever been a part of the birthing experience, you know what I'm talking about. It's miraculous. It's a miracle. It's, it's grace. I remember after Penny gave birth and I held Jonathan in my arms and looked at him, I thought, what a miracle. I didn't have a whole lot to do with this. Well, I guess I did have a little bit to do with it. But it's really a, a miracle of creation, a gift, God's pure gift of grace. Every time we have a little baby get dedicated or baptized, that little one just growing and, and squirming, and then they develop and grow into a person, I think, wow. What a gift. We realize something else when we look at God's grace in creation. We see that God's grace is extravagant. It's, it's over the top. When you consider for a moment the diversity, the extravagance of God's amazing creation, did you know that only a tiny fraction of all species on earth have been discovered and named? I learned recently that biologists have uh, categorized a total of between 1.5 and 1.8 million species. But they think that there's somewhere, maybe as many as 100 million species. What is more astonishing is that some scientists estimate that 95% of all species that have ever existed are extinct. In one 2.5 acre of Brazil's rainforest, there are 425 kinds of trees. And in one small corner of Peru's Manu, uh, National Park, there are more than 1,300 butterflies, species of butterflies. It's, this is amazing stuff. I think about that, that video we just saw. The Earth compared to the rest of the universe is, is so small, and creation is so big. God is so extravagant in, in his love for us. He spoke it into existence. And God governs and sustains it with great precision and accuracy. Not one detail is missing. So as we see the big picture, God spoke all this into existence. He holds all this together because of his grace, because of his pure love for us. And remember, it's God's common grace. It's for everyone. The, the, it doesn't matter what they believe. They're all experiencing God's common grace, whether you're Muslim or Buddhist or an atheist. They're all experience God's common grace, but we experience God's saving grace, and that makes all the difference in the world. 
What should our response be to God's saving grace? Well, we have a choice, don't we? We either acknowledge that all of life is a gift from God, or we don't. We either live under grace and live in gratitude to God for all that he's done for us, for our salvation, for our relationship with God, or we don't. Listen again to the psalmist's response of praise to God. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, all that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Thank God for his grace to us, that we can experience not only common grace, but as Christians, we experience God's savings grace. But like any other gift, the gift of grace is yours and mine only if we reach out and take it. Maybe even being able to reach out and take it is a gift as well. Let's pause for a moment of silent prayer. Lord, we are so thankful that we are recipients of your grace and your love toward us. It's not something we deserve, but it's something you've freely given to us, and we're so thankful. Thank you, God, for your love for us. It's demonstrated in holding little babies or, or being with good friends and sharing a meal or being able just to stand up and walk around. We're so thankful, God. So, Lord, I pray that you make us mindful of your creation and that we'll be good stewards of your creation because you've given it to us to, to take care of us. And we thank you for just the beauty of this place in Southern California, for the, the mountains and, and the, the clear skies we've been experiencing and the wind and, and just the beautiful stars at night. Thank you, God, so much. We pray these things in your name. Amen. At this time, I invite the ushers to collect our morning offering. And this week, we continue to collect funds towards the Christmas food baskets for the families of the Pan American Institute. If you would like to give, any amount is helpful, and mark your offering PAI Christmas baskets. You're also welcome to give online. Visit our website, fcca.org. We have options to give through Zelle or PayPal. And again, if you'd like to give online towards the Christmas baskets, there's a memo line um, to designate your gift.
Let us pray for the offering. God, help us to remember that generosity is an act of worship and trust. Lord, we thank you for all the gifts that are ours, and we thank you for the gifts you've given this church. Give us wisdom and guidance how to use them for the building of your kingdom. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand and join together in our final hymn, Morning Has Broken. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his counts upon you and give you his peace, both now and forever. Amen.